Ren is currently a professor, assistant professor in the School of Planning in <coughs> Dalhousie. Uh, she's also had lots of interesting experiences. Uh, she was a visiting professor uh, at the University of Oregon. She worked for a number of years uh, in Amsterdam on research transportation projects. Uh, she has run her own consulting firm. She's worked for uh, Canada Housing Corporation, uh, runs her own consulting firm. Uh, so she's had a fair, fair number of years of, of planning experience. And uh, she's also uh, published uh, one, one of the uh, more recent books on planning in Canada, which came out in 2016 on planning and won the uh, Canadian Institute of Planners Award for that year. So uh, Ren has a PhD from the University of British Columbia in planning and a master's degree in planning uh, from UBC as well. And we're going to be really lucky today because Ren is going to tell us how to solve uh, our housing problems. <laughs> Hopefully. <So we'll laughs> because as we all know, we have huge housing problems. So housing policies for sustainable regions, preliminary lessons from policy analysis of 15 Canadian uh, municipalities. So Ren, welcome. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Tom. Oh, yeah, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for having me. It's always great to come back to Vancouver. I lived here for seven years, so it's always uh, I haven't been here since my book was launched two years ago. So it's it's exciting to be back, get those mountain views again. <laughs> Can never get sick of that. So um, yeah. So I, what I'm going to do today, I'll introduce myself and my research areas. Um, I'll spend some time uh, on this study that is uh, that Tom uh, mentioned is on 15 Canadian municipalities and looking at their rental housing policies. And then I'll discuss my future research and where where I see that fitting into what you, you're doing here at REM and um, at SFU generally. And then um, in the final section, I'm going to present a little bit on my teaching philosophy. And I'll give some examples of um, teaching approaches that I've used in courses. So um, yeah, so Tom kind of stole my first line there, which is <laughs> my background at, at SCARP, UBC. Uh, I did my master's and PhD there. Um, I'm a member of the uh, of the Canadian Institute of Planners through uh, PIBC, which is the provincial organization here in BC. So um, because I did my education here, I just kept my uh, membership with PIBC, which is a fantastic organization. <laughs> and then I have a, a number of, worked in a number of different uh, places over the years. I worked at Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation in sustainable community development for three years um, before I came back to school, actually, before I um, did my master's. And then while I was in BC, I, could, I was able to work for a number of different organizations, including TransLink and BC Nonprofit Housing Association, Mustel Group, which does uh, market research on transportation and other issues. And then um, I was in the University of Amsterdam for two years on this project on transportation. Um, and then I worked for the Ontario Growth Secretariat on growth management policy, so the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And um, then finally, uh, just before I got the job at Dalhousie two years ago, I worked at the University of Oregon in Eugene in a teaching only position there. So kind of a range of different experiences <laughs> that have contributed to what I'm doing today. So. Um, these are really where my research areas lie. They really cross into these two areas of affordable housing and sustainable transportation. But really, the area that links the two of them is um, you know, this, I, this idea of how, how can we develop more sustainable cities. And we really do that in planning through growth management um, and through regional planning. And so that's sort of the overarching thing that links these two areas of research. And in both housing and transportation, I'm really interested in sort of collaboration, like who, who's involved in making these decisions, who are the different organizations, how do they work together to uh, make these kinds of uh, policies happen, uh, implement new infrastructure and that kind of thing. So that's really what I'm interested in learning about um, in general. So this is a summary of the, pro the actual projects that I've worked on. So I started actually on the transportation side, so I'll start there. But my master's research was, was the study of youth and young adults and their transportation patterns in Surrey and Vancouver. Um, and then for my PhD, I um, switched more towards looking at immigrants, uh, looking at Filipino immigrants and their housing and transportation choices. Um, and then the study in Amsterdam was on transit-oriented development and looking at sort of barriers to um, barriers and how sort of international cities overcame those barriers to implementation. 
And then on the housing side, right now at Dalhousie, I'm working on these two projects, uh, rental housing in Canadian cities, which I'll be talking about today, and this other study, which is uh, the Neighborhood Change Research Partnership, which is a huge national study where we're looking at how Canadian cities have changed over time in a lot of different ways. Our particular, uh, the Halifax team is really looking at housing and how housing has changed, and in my, my particular focus is on nonprofit housing, so that's what I've been working on. And so just to kind of illustrate that those two of those, two of those projects, the the trans transit-oriented development one and the rental housing one do kind of impact into the growth management policy area. And I'll, I'll talk about why that, why that is. <laughs> so um, there's a couple of theories that I thought might be interesting to uh, introduce first because they, they do sort of underpin the kind of work that I do. Uh, the first one is the kind of theory around resilience. Um, so there's sort of two... I guess, metaphors about resilience that really are the most relevant to affordable housing and, trans and transportation. So the first is this idea about simple resilience, so that um, the idea that a, there, a material has the ability to absorb energy, and then after unloading that energy, um, it, it can be it can return back to its normal state. And the definition for psychological resilience is sort of similar. It's like the idea that um, individuals sort of have the ability to cope with stress or adversity, and then kind of bounce back to their their previous state of normal functioning. And there's been a number of uh, researchers and uh, writers over the years who have tried to link resilience to you know, urban centers, um, how we can try to make our cities more resilient, our systems, our urban systems more resilient. If we think about, um, you know, obviously one of the big things right now is climate change. We're trying to get our cities to be a little bit more and our settlements to be more adaptive to, towards a changing climate. Um, but if we think about housing, um, we can think about you know, the housing system and how can we make that system more resilient. So one of the ways um, might be, uh, if you think about um, you know, if there's kind of stresses on that system, maybe there's a lot of new people coming into the city all the time, so there's this pr constant pressure, we need a lot of new units. Um, and if this system was resilient, it would be able to recover from those kinds of effects. And you wouldn't see things like deterioration of buildings, or you wouldn't see things like loss of units over time. But in fact, that's actually what we see happening in most Canadian cities, is that we have a for example, a loss of rental units over time, we're losing affordability, um, and there's these kinds of things are, are, are happening. So, um, and then in, in terms of psychological resilience, we can, we can imagine that housing has the opportunity, has the ability to provide individuals with the stability that they need to kind of address other issues that, that are going on. And you see that in the housing first approaches when cities are, um, are trying to address homelessness, they take this approach that housing is so important that as soon as you stabilize somebody into, into housing that they can rely on and they're not gonna be evicted, they can then start to address all of their other issues like mental health issues and addictions and all those kind of other things that they're dealing with. So there's, there's I think, a, a natural fit with these resilience metaphors and, and kind of the area of housing. Um, the second theory that, that has been influential with my work is the idea that planners use case studies to learn. They use them as a learning tool. And we see this both in practice and also in research. So practicing planners might be interested in, let's say they work for a municipality and they want to implement a new policy, let's say on multiple unit dwellings, they're gonna look at other cities and see what other cities have done. So that's a kind of a practice case study. An academic might take a, a maybe look at maybe in depth into a process. They might look in, in depth into a trend that's happening right now, like maybe the housing patterns of a specific immigrant community or patterns of seniors or something like that. So, so case studies have been used a lot for learning um, and they've been used a lot as, you know, for academic, the topic for academic research. But there's a number of problems with, with them, I think. Um, one thing is that we tend to go really in depth into a single case. And what that means is that the findings from that case study are often seen as very specific to that, that case. So we think, oh, well, that's very specific to Tokyo or it's really specific to, you know, New York City or something like that. And that would never work here, you know, for whatever reason. So it makes it a little bit difficult if you're trying to do case studies for the purpose of policy you know, to influence policy, it makes it a little harder because you know, these findings are not statistically generalizable. Um, they're difficult for policymakers to use because it's hard, to, for them, it's hard for people to separate that context out. And so one of the things that can help, help us with that in, uh, you know, in, in research is designing either multiple case studies where we're looking at a number of different cases all at one time. We're, taking, we're looking at similar cases and we're taking the same approach to each of those. So we're studying them in a sort of the same way and, and that way we'll get a little bit more understanding of what's going on in that particular trend or phenomenon that we're looking for rather than just learning about it in one case. So you're starting to almost separate the context a little bit out. 
The other thing that we can do is case comparison or synthesis. And this is what I did on that TOD study in Amsterdam that I was talking about. We actually use completed case studies in these, these TO, for these TOD cases. And um, because there's so many case studies in planning, so many single case studies that we were able to like pull those and look for basically um, the trends across with, with this meta-analysis or cross case patterns. And you're looking for what's common across these cases, what's different across these cases. And is there anything that we can, you know, is there a kind of a theory that we can draw from this that we we can then apply using um, not statistical generalization, but analytic generalization, which is the, uh, the idea that you know you're, you can take you can apply those findings or that, that theory to similar cases. So cities of the same size, cities of the same type, cities in the same country, let's say. <clears throat> so um, for planners, uh, yeah. So we can we can also use case studies. Um, one of the things we did on that study in Amsterdam is is to use case studies to understand, you know, how can those ideas or lessons from the cases actually um, be used in policy development. So we can, there's this kind of idea called policy transfer, which is the idea that, you know, you have a policy or an idea or a, let's say you've implemented something in one city or one country and you want to try to apply to somewhere else. So... You can try, you have this lending city, you have a borrowing city, and you want to try to see if that is going to work in, in the new place. So this happens all the time in planning. We see, you know, you know, for climate change strategy, or we see a transportation approach that's done in one city, and we want to try to make it happen, let's say, in Vancouver. So it obviously, there's some problems with doing this. Um, there's a... For one thing, policies tend to be transferred between countries that are similar. So we're borrowing more from the US, the UK, and Australia than we are from other countries that maybe are not culturally the same and maybe don't have the same legal or political system that we do. Um, it can be really difficult to transfer, let's say, the softer aspects. Those ideas about collaboration, partnership, um, values, paradigms, and those kind of things are harder to transfer than um, things like you know, very specific tools or strategies or, or even legislation. So um, what can happen then is um, that you could get you know, some issues with this. So you could get incomplete transfer or uninformed transfer or just inappropriate, like you're taking an idea that just would never work in your cultural context or, or um, political context. So it's important that planners, you know, that we understand how to use ideas from other places um, in a way that's, you know, not just mere copying. And one of the ways we can do that is to take a bunch of ideas from, from different places and use them, um, take them as, as sort of lessons that we can learn from. So then we can come up with our own approach to this that is more suited to our place, our locality. So we can maybe come up with some kind of hybrid approach. So instead of copying, we're just using these ideas as learning or inspiration. So that, this is a kind of the kind of theoretical framework that, <laughs> that shapes this study that I'm working on now. So this is the study. Um, it is... Uh, it's a bit of a risky approach for me to take today because <laughs> I'm taking a little bit of a gamble because I've just finished the first stage of this study, so I have very preliminary findings for this. But I thought it was a really interesting one for, for you to hear about because it's the first one that I've been the uh, principal investigator on. It's the first one that I've, I've gotten funded by a tri-council grant, so I just found out last week that it's funded by um, the SHRC uh, Insight Development Grant. And um, I also think that it has a lot of it has a lot to offer in terms of this idea of how do we get to more sustainable cities? You know, how do we, you know, what are some what are some ways that we can build more sustainable infrastructure that's going to take us to where we want to go? So the goals for this study are to catalyze new municipal policies and programs in rental housing through policy learning, and then to synthesize knowledge from case study cities on the barriers and solutions to rental housing protection and also development of new rental housing through this kind of systematic case comparison. So this is, as I mentioned, a, a method that can offers us a lot of you know, opportunity in knowledge development and sort of analytic generalization. So why are, you know, why should we even study housing policies? Why are they even important? Um, I think that in areas like housing and transportation, they really, you know, plans and policies and strategies really have the ability to push our regions in a much more sustainable direction. So just to give a couple of examples, um, density bonuses or secondary suites are a couple of tools that are used by most, most cities, uh, most large cities anyway. And they really have the ability to, um, you know, promote densification. Uh, we can then densify in areas that we want. Um, so areas that already have built up infrastructure like downtowns, transportation corridors or nodes. So this, uh, this is really a kind of a growth management, part of a whole growth management strategy or approach. We also have the ability to protect um, and to build new affordable housing in areas like transit corridors, which helps 
prevent displacement. Uh, and that really does ensure social sustainability in neighborhoods, you know, as neighborhoods are gentrifying, they're increasing in value all the time. But it also protects these sustainable choices that people are making, because often people who live in affordable, you know, units also don't own cars. Um, so they're making, they're already traveling by transit, they're already making these choices. And so if we want to protect those, we have to make sure that they still have those options. Otherwise, they're going to get displaced out, and they're going to have to buy cars and, and this kind of thing. So these are the research questions for the project. Um, first, what are the barriers to the implementation and protection of rental housing in Canadian cities? And then second, how have municipal planners, housing providers, and developers overcome these barriers to implement you know, new solutions to the protection of existing housing and the implementation of new rental housing? And we're looking at the whole spectrum of rental, all the way from market rental down to subsidized rental housing. And then what is the role of the new national housing strategy, which just came online basically last fall and it's still being rolled out now. So what is the role of that new national housing strategy in supporting the development of these, of these uh, different options, both protection and implementation of new housing? So the approach that I took this generally is that in phase one, I'm going to be doing uh, basically creating the cases. So we're actually taking that multiple case approach. So the policy analysis include is the first part of that where I'm examining these policies and plans and strategies of 15 Canadian municipalities. I had three research assistants on that this year, uh, two undergrads and one grad student. So they each took five cities and we, that's how we started the policy analysis. That's just being completed last week. And then I'm launching a survey, also launched last week, um, <coughs> with the municipal planners and, and people who are actually working in housing provision to find out, you know, is there, is there anything else that we need to know about things more like collaboration? How are you working together? Are you taking more of a regional approach to this issue? Are you, is it just your city that's taking that approach? So we need to, we need to know a little bit more um, from them uh, than we can get from just the policy documents. And then phase two will include this meta-analysis. So at that point, I'll have the completed case studies. I'll be able to look at, you know, what are these patterns across, you know, cross-case patterns. And then I'll be able to develop these policy lessons that can be used in the workshop that we'll be holding in probably February of the next year. And that will be the policy transfer where we actually take those ideas from other cities, tell, the, tell people about them in Halifax, and, and see if they can develop their own kind of approaches to rental housing provision. So uh, the 15 case study cities were chosen uh, for their range of population size. So we have a range from two, like 200,000 all the way up to 4 million. Montreal is the largest city we, we chose. Um, and we also chose them for their range of approaches to rental housing policy plans and programs. So some of them are doing quite innovative things um, and others of them are not as innovative. And we really wanted to get that range to see um, what some of the constraints, what some of the barriers might be. Um, because it's really important to understand if, if cities aren't doing well, why aren't they doing well? And there really are these issues that have already been coming out. Issues like collaboration, whether they're taking like a really limited approach to defining you know, these kinds of issues um, in their city. So we have this kind Kind of um, grouping of small to mid-sized cities, Victoria, Saskatoon, Regina, Windsor, and Sherbrooke, Quebec. And then mid-sized are Winnipeg, Waterloo, Hamilton, Mississauga, and Halifax. And then the large cities are Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, and Montreal. So this is um, a little bit of data on those cities. I don't know about you, but when I, whenever I see tables like this, and there, there's all these tiny numbers, and people go, well, as you can see, the data. So I'm not gonna do, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> what I'm gonna do is just tell you a few points that, that I think are important, <laughs> that you don't have to like look at all these numbers. So the, the, the one thing is that most of these, all of these numbers, except for the last row, come from CMH, or sorry, come from the census. The last row comes from CMHC's rental market reports, which are pro produced annually. Um, and so basically the main thing that I want to tell you is like what are some of the what are some of the major issues that cities are facing? And so one of the issues, one of the things that CMHC uses as a measure is this thing called core housing need. And this is where they they basically determine whether which which percentage of households are really in dire need of housing. So either they live in housing that's not affordable, it's not suitable, or it's not adequate. And suitable refers to the size, adequate refers to the quality. So I'm focusing here on the on the affordability component. So these two, the first two variables I'm going to talk about are right from the center. And they basically are whether households are paying over 30% of their pre-tax income towards their shelter costs. And so that's a measure right from the census. And so what we find when we look at it is Vancouver and Mississauga are well over the median of 19%. Halifax and Saskatoon are actually quite a lot lower. 
And if we look specifically at renter households or tenant households, the range of people who are paying over 30% is much higher. We're talking in the 30s and 40% range. Whereas um, you know, for the for households in general, it's usually in the teens or 20s. So, um, and again, for the tenant households that are paying a lot more, um, it is, again, like um, Mississauga, Regina, Saskatoon. So Mississauga comes up there a lot as you know, people are really paying quite a lot uh, for their rental housing. There are some cities that have quite high ratios of people who are renting as well. So the percentage of people who are renting is highest in Sherbrooke, Halifax, and Montreal, quite a lot higher than the median of 31%. And then finally, for market rental vacancy, there's some cities who are doing quite well. So CMHC's ratio for market rental vacancy is 3%. If you, if you have a vacancy of 3% or higher, CMHC considers that you know, sort of a healthy range. FYI, Vancouver's been less than 1.4% since 1971. Anyway. <laughs> so not healthy. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so the, the ones that have the highest vacancy rates are, are listed there. Sherbrooke, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, and Regina. So they're well over that. They're actually well over 5%, so they're quite healthy. So uh, that was just a little bit of background on the cities. It's some preliminary findings for you here um, on, on what cities are doing, what, what programs or approaches that they're taking to rental housing. Um, for one thing, all of the cities have rent supplement programs. These are offered actually through the, the province. So you know, each province has a program like this. Some of them have really unique ones that I just wanted to mention. Sherbrooke and Montreal have a joint program with the province. So they actually partner with um, nonprofits and municipal housing departments and co-ops, cooperative housing cooperatives, so that people who live in those, in those units only pay 25% of their income towards shelter. So that's a really innovative approach. Um, Saskatoon actually has a really cool program for seniors that live in small communities. So some of these rent supplement programs are, are quite interesting. Um, most cities have programs for rehabilitation or renovation. Those are also come, that, actually that comes right through CMHC, so it comes from the federal level. And again, there's some interesting ones out there. Um, there's um, there's um, Halifax and Saskatoon have programs specifically for rooming houses, to, to renovate rooming houses. And several of the cities have specific programs to renovate secondary suites. So there's some kind of interesting ones going on there. There is, um, Windsor, Ontario has a really interesting one. It's for social housing. So it's for their, it's for their kind of public housing high rise projects. And it's funded through the province of Ontario's carbon market. And it's supposed to be for renovations that, um, that decrease greenhouse gas emissions. So that's kind of an interesting one there too. And then all of the cities have this housing first approach to homelessness, which includes the creation of new affordable rental units. Um, Victoria, capital region district over in Victoria is currently building 2,000 new rental units um, as part of their housing first approach. And they're gonna be um, integrating those into mixed income unit or mixed income projects. So people won't be kind of into their own buildings. Um, another one that is pretty common across the cities is condo conversion policies. So most uh, cities have policies to prevent rental buildings from being converted to condominiums if the vacancy rate typically is less than that 3%. Sometimes it's uh, a different rate. Um, Hamilton's rule was 2%. In 2014, they dipped below 1.6%, so they introduced a moratorium. So for two years, they're like, we're not, you know, we're not allowing any condos to be converted or any, any rental units to be converted. They had already lost 2,000 units in the past 10 years, so they were really, <laughs> they really kind of got a bit strict on it. Uh, Saskatoon also has a really strict policy um, if, you, if the vacancy rate goes below 1.5%. So some of the cities um, are, you know, they all, have, they all have policies, but some of them are quite stronger than others in what they can do. Um, and then two thirds of the cities actually um, are able to sell municipally owned land to developers, usually nonprofits or sometimes housing agencies that then they can then use to develop affordable housing. Um, several cities have recently made secondary suites easier to develop. Um, I know Mississauga just introduced legislation on this. Edmonton actually has a great, they, they're very into this. They're trying to get 75 new secondary suites every year and then 75 other ones through renovation. So they're really, they're providing a lot of grant money for um, households to do that. Um, there's several cities that it re either reduce or eliminate development fees for affordable housing projects, um, including, including Vancouver. Um, like the region of Waterloo has grants to offset those development fees. So if you're a nonprofit organization, then they, they allow you to apply for this grant and you can get that money, that development charge money back. And then about a third of the cities offer basically capital grants for new rental units. I think Regina and Saskatoon are the most innovative here. They, they offer quite a lot of money for, for example, in Saskatoon, um, if you guarantee that the unit is going to be affordable for 15 years, they, they have a whole rebate program for that. 
Um, and then in Regina, it's um, as long as the units are affordable to people who are below the province's low income threshold, then they will, they will uh, offer you this, this grant money and they have to guarantee that it's gonna stay affordable for five years in that case. And then the last one that is interesting is inclusionary zoning. Some of you might have heard about this policy because it's been in the news a lot lately. It wasn't allowed in Canada at all until fairly recently, actually. Uh, it's been much more prevalent in the US, um, but it's basically the idea that cities can require that all new development, uh, all new residential development has a proportion of housing that is affordable. And so um, the cities that allow it, there's, there's really only I think five cities that allow it right now. And out of these, Winnipeg is the only one that, that has like a widespread inclusionary zoning rule. Vancouver tends to take a more uh, like area specific approach. Like just on Friday, the mayor announced that um, in the Oak Ridge Neighborhood Center that all the new rental buildings where you were gonna be applying for rezoning. So if you're applying for a higher building than the zoning allows for, then you have to, it has to be 100% rental and 25% of the units have to be affordable. So like, that's kind of a more area specific approach. It's not like in the whole city, it's like in that one area. And the reason it, for that is that it's, it's on the frequent transit network. So that's part of the Vancouver's approach to that is tying affordable housing to transportation. So some of the differences is uh, some very few cities actually have what, what are called municipal development corporations. So these are companies that are typically they're owned by the city. So um, they're a corporation, but they're actually owned by owned and operated by the city usually. So there's a really cool one in Hamilton. Winnipeg also has a really interesting one. The Hamilton one is is cool because it's a really collaborative organization. They they, they actually run and manage I think seven or seven thousand units. Most of those units, I think eighty percent of them are rent geared to income. So again, people are only paying twenty five percent of their income towards housing. Um, and that organization is really, they're, is really collaborative. Their board is actually made up of half members are city councillors and the other half are, are members of community-based organizations. So it's a very community-driven one. And they really emphasize collaboration across disciplines, across agencies. So there's also some interesting organizations and, and institutions that are coming out of the study, not just the policies themselves. Um, very few cities actually have the plans or strategies that emphasize building affordable housing near public transit. And Vancouver's housing strategy is, is the best one really out there. It's, it's really the strongest emphasis where it really has the whole map of frequent transit network right in there and it suggests sites that we're supposed to be building, where we're supposed to be building affordable housing. Edmonton also has a very good uh, plan. They have this um, housing and supports plan saying that people who need supportive housing should be, you know, those, those units should be located near transit. Um, just a few of the cities offer property tax forgiveness for nonprofits, so that would allow them to, you know, get back, you know, some money every year. So for housing co-ops, for example, uh, only a few cities have housing reserve funds. I actually thought that, having gone to planning school here, I thought that was normal because Vancouver has it, <laughs> but it's only Vancouver, Victoria, and Saskatoon that actually have a housing reserve fund that they it, they put a part of those development fees in there, and then eventually they end up with this pool of money that they can use for affordable housing. And then only two cities, Victoria and Saskatoon, actually maintain municipal land banks. So that over the years, a municipality has like, you know, purchased up all this land. They've been doing it for over 40 years, so it's quite a long time. So they have a lot of land. Um, it's, it's, other cities are kind of jealous of this, actually, because well, we should have started that a lot sooner. So that enables them to do, to do a lot more with affordable housing than, they, than other cities can do. So these are some of the kind of unique approaches. So all of these things, the similarities, the differences, and then these kind of unique approaches, um, where in this case only one city maybe is doing it, or one province. Um, all of these are gonna contribute to these policy lessons that I'm gonna then use in the next stage of the this, of this study, you know, to do the workshop with people. So, um, some of these, I'll just mention a few of these because uh, there's, there's some, some of them are really interesting. So Vancouver has this Housing 100. I don't know if you've heard of this policy, but it's been around. They did the pilot for it in 20, 2011, I think. Uh, they did a year and a half pilot project where they basically wanted to encourage uh, buildings that were 100% rental. And so they did that through offering developers a whole package of incentives. So they'd say you can put in less parking spaces, you know, we'll, we'll waive a percentage of your development fees and we'll do all these things so you can, you'll build this kind of housing. And it's been extremely successful. I think 20% of new units that have been built in Vancouver since 2012 have been rental units. So it's been hugely successful uh, in Vancouver. Um, another Vancouver one that is, um, the Rental Housing Protection Bylaw and or Rental Stock Official Development Plan. And that really ensures that if you're proposing in your new development that a number of rental units are going to be demolished, you have to guarantee that they're gonna be replaced in the new development. So that is a really unique, like I think Vancouver is the only place in Canada that, that re actually requires that. So that's pretty interesting. Um, 
so talking about those organizations again, City of Edmonton has two that are really interesting, Homeward Trust and Federation of Community Leagues. So Edmonton has a really long history of community involvement in planning. So people who aren't professionally planners and don't work for a municipality have been really involved. So these two organizations in particular are nonprofits, they're community-based. They've been instrumental in implementing the housing plans that have come forward. They've actually even done evaluation and monitoring of the plans you know, several years down the road. So there's, um, again, very collaborative approach, very community-based approach in some of these cities. That's, that's very interesting. And it really kind of, that's really what you need to have a more regional a regional effect, you know, on kind of sustainability and those issues. Um, and then uh, just another interesting one that I want to mention was the uh, province of Quebec has this project called Accès Logis. Um, it is a pro it's a program that supports basically crowdfunding of affordable housing. So what they do is if, if you're a community group or a housing agency or a nonprofit, you can, and, and you, if you have the support of the municipality, you can apply for these grants and the grants will allow you to build your housing um, and then the municipality would, would put in a percentage of the cost. So Sherbrooke, which is a tiny city, like 200, not tiny, but it's 200,000, it's the smallest city in our sample actually, um, they put in 15% uh, towards each of these projects and that allowed them to build, I think about 250 units over the kind of this, time period from 2016 to 2019. So, you know, for a city that of that size to kind of invest that type of money um, is it's pretty significant. So those are a few of the kind of unique approaches that we see happening in cities right now. So what does this all mean for sustainable regions? Um, you know, how does this kind of go back to that, those issues that I was talking about earlier? Well, if we're using that, those resilience theories, again, using the simple resilience theories, the more housing choices that exist within the system, the more resilient the system is. So if we look back, it seems like a long time ago now, with the US mortgage crisis, <laughs> so 10 years ago now, um, that when that crisis happened, and of course people were not able to live in their homes, there had been such an emphasis on ownership in the US for so long. So 70 to 80% of people in most regions were owning. So it meant that the system was actually a lot less resilient. So what the federal government did, one of the first things they did after the crisis was buy up some of those foreclosed homes and use and actually make them available as rental housing so that families could actually stay in the same neighborhood that they were, they'd been living in. So just introducing more choice, whether it's through rent supplements, whether it's protecting existing rental housing, you know, however we do that is going to improve the resilience of the system. Um, we also do see improved psychological resilience for people who are in precarious housing situations. And we know all oh, that's a big thing here in Vancouver, places like you know, Victoria and Mississauga, some of these cities where you know, housing, people are in these precarious situations, they have lost their housing in some cases, and getting them back into stable housing through you know, these housing first approaches is really uh, critical to um, bringing people back up to a level where they can maybe work and they can maybe contribute to you know, their communities a bit more again. And then we're protecting social sustainability by making sure that people aren't displaced. So when we're protecting that affordable housing in transit corridors, that's one way that we're you know, preventing people from being forced out, maybe having to make less sustainable choices um, in the new place that they're living. And then uh, finally, we do see increased density in urban areas through things like the, um, you know, the density bonuses or uh, secondary suites even, introducing secondary suites. For example, in Vancouver, we allow secondary suites in every area that's zoned for housing. So it really helps kind of increase kind of this gentle approach to increasing density in areas where people don't want a huge high rise tower in their community, but it's still increasing a little bit more units. Typically those are affordable units that people can, uh, that people can rent. <clears throat> So next steps for this project. So I've just completed the policy analysis um, and then I'll be completing the survey by August. So that'll be the end of phase one. Uh, pretty much, yeah, the data analysis will be completed in the fall. And then phase two will be starting. So we'll start that meta-analysis and then getting preparing for the policy workshop, which is gonna be happening in February. So some of the anticipated contributions that I see from this study um, is this policy analysis piece. So we'll understand a little bit more about what Canadian cities have to offer, like what, how have they overcome these barriers? What are some unique solutions that they have to offer maybe to other cities? So I'm gonna present a paper on that actually in two weeks at the Association of European Schools of Planning conference, which is happening in Sweden. Um, and then I'm, I'll submit the article from that to Cities Journal. Um, in the fall, I'll be presenting the, a paper on the survey results, so that will hopefully be getting, again, more into those solutions um, and some of that collaboration component and how are people taking more of a regional approach to, um, to planning for housing. Um, I'll be presenting that at the American Collegiate Schools of Planning conference in the fall, 
and um, I'll be submitting that article to the International Journal of Housing Policy. And then finally, uh, when I do, after I do the policy learning workshop, I'll be um, writing a paper on that that I'll be submitting to both Plan Canada and then Town Planning Review. Um, and that'll be more of, the, more of the information that's interesting to practitioners, which is like, how do you take these ideas from other places and actually apply them in, your, in the place where you live? And then for planning practice, so that I did say at the end there that, that I ho I'm hoping that these policy learning, the policy learning workshop will have an effect in, in my city, in Halifax, but I'm also gonna make a video uh, which, is gonna, which is going to be about those policy lessons. Um, we have this fantastic student, <laughs> two students that graduated from our program that founded a nonprofit where they, they do planning videos, so they're really interested in planning education. Uh, one of them just moved here to Vancouver, so anyway, we'll be making a video on, on this project and I'll be using the video in when I present it at the planning conferences as well and hopefully online. So that'll get the, the kind of these policy ideas out there to other people, other practitioners. And I'm also a member of the McEachan Institute of Public Policy and Governance at, um, uh, in Halifax and Dalhousie. So we're hoping that having the workshop in association with the Policy Institute will also help get the word out there to other people in practice. So... This is the sort of trajectory that I've already produced, articles that I've already produced, and then you can see that side is completely blank because that's where all the new stuff is, <laughs> is gonna go. So I've produced two articles on the youth and young adults transportation choices, and then another two on immigrants, housing and transportation choices, and then four on the, on the transportation, the TOD study, and then I just submitted a book proposal for the TOD work as well. So hopefully that other side and the growth management side are gonna be more populated after <laughs> the next studies are finished. Um, and they also write in a less formal way on my blog. I tend to write about what's going on in cities right now, or I do write a little bit about the research um, that I've been working on. I also write about student research and things that are happening in my classroom. So I have some applied projects that students work on that I write about on my blog as well. So I, I think this, to me, is like this, again, this idea of planning education is really important because um, a lot of people don't really know what planners do, and it really complicates the work that we do because you really do need, again, that collaborative, that kind of, you know, we need the public to understand what you're doing and why, and we, we need there to be bottom-up approaches as well as top-down approaches. And so the only way you can do that is pe if people understand what planning is and, and why, we're, why we're doing the things that we're doing. So this is sort of my five-year strategy. I won't go into all the details of it, but generally I have these three studies that I'm working on now, the rental housing one, um, one on nonprofit housing, and another one on the use of case studies in teaching. So those three will be wrapping up in the for the next two years, and then I'll be starting two new projects, one on growth management policy, and another one on temporary and modular housing in Canadian cities. So um, that's sort of what this, that's basically the trajectory of what's going on here. So more detail than I have time to go into. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna ask if there's any questions about the research side, because I just have a little bit more about teaching right now. So before I go on, I'll just see if there's any <laughs> burning questions that need to be answered. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you showed the slide up where you were talking about how the policy... Oh, hang on for a second. Oh, Carolyn, oh yes. Right. You want to record these forever. Yes. Request for the it. film. <laughs> for the film version. <laughs> okay, th first of all, my name is Karen. Yes. And, um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, it, it was a really fascinating summary of a problem that we're all facing here in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, I was taken by one of your slides where you s said, how do these policies contribute to sustainable cities? Mm -hmm. And you listed four ways in which that could happen. But what I'm curious about is whether you have, how you have proof that, the, that, that, that these policies are actually contributing to this and that it is creating this resilience. Mm -hmm. And um, also, what critical, how do you know what critical levels of support you need to provide? Mm -hmm. Is fifteen percent enough, or do you need to have fifty percent? Mm -hmm. And and so I was really curious from that slide what evidence supports those a scientific force. question. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm not a planner. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so changing. the thing with planning is there really is no kind of there is no kind of one size fits all, I guess I would say. There's no kind of one thing that works. There's no kind of one level that works for every city. So every city is completely different. So it's really hard to say, um, you know, well, you know, we should, we should be supporting, we should have like 50% rental housing in our cities and that will make the, the system more resilient because we don't, have, it's not the same situation in every city. For example, cities in Quebec have way higher rental rates than anywhere else in Canada because it's a cultural kind of 
trend to rent rather than own. So there really isn't, it's an interesting question, but there really, I, it's, it's a hard question to answer, I think, because there really isn't a one, there isn't one level that makes sense for every city. Um, it really depends on the size of the city as well, you know, the kind of economic situation in the city, like where do people work, what kinds of jobs are available. So for example, a city like Ottawa, where most people work in the federal government, incomes are high, um, so that impacts what, you need there. Um, Montreal, um, if we look at Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, they all get huge numbers of immigrants coming in every year, but Montreal gets way more refugee claimants than Toronto or Vancouver does. So the type of housing they're gonna need there is gonna be, is gonna be different. Yeah. So with the meta-analysis that you've done, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna yell. Oh, yeah, no, she's got it, she's got it, she's got it. <laughs> You're used to it, yes. <laughs> um, so with the analysis that it, you've done, that this meta-analysis, it seems that you have quantitative data that would allow you to actually examine some of these questions and look at that type of resilience to see with whether these policies are, I mean, before and after um, the economic crisis, as an example, to, to right. the variables and kind of try and quantify some of these paradigms. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, so the meta-analysis, I won't, I won't be done until the fall because we still have the survey results to, to get at. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is a good question. But um, I think that we want to do more work with the, the census data to look at what are those factors that are, that are important. So, you know, you know, what is impacting the vacancy rate and all those kinds of things. But the problem is you, there isn't data that shows it's very hard to prove those relationships. And in terms of before and after with policy, I think people who work on policy know it's, it's very difficult to measure those kinds of things because there isn't, you'd have to set out to like do a study right before the data, right before the policy went into place and then do something right afterwards, which is pretty much never happens. So it's really hard to kind of prove that X policy works. However, I will say that some cities are really, really good at doing that. Vancouver is actually excellent at that. They have really good um, documentation. They, they monitor their number of units really closely and then they put the policy in place. They actually do pilot, so they'll pilot a, uh, you know, a policy for two years. That's what they did with the rent, uh, rental 100 policy. And then they'll, they'll measure how that worked, how many units did we get? And then they'll say, okay, well, we're gonna make this a formal policy now because it's definitely working. And then they'll continue to measure it. So some cities are really, really good at that. So we actually have, we can actually, but not every city is. So when you look at all these 15 cities, it's like maybe one or two of them are gonna have that kind of data. So it's, you can't really do across, yeah. You can't really get that numbers all across. It would be great if you could. But I worked for the growth secretariat in Ontario, which covers, oops, 139 different municipalities in the greater Golden Horseshoe area. And it's really, really hard to get to, like when we talk about, you know, the region's doing this or the region's going that, you know, that way, it's really hard because the cities don't measure everything in the same way. So it's unfortunate, but yeah, it's really hard to do that kind of cross comparison with quantitative. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Ryan. I really, really enjoyed the, the presentation. You know, fascinating cross-Canada perspective as well that you bring to it all. Um, I've got two questions related to the research. The first is, um, you know, you brought you brought up resilience and building on uh, on Karen's point a little bit, but um, both at a systemic level, and then you also mentioning sort of the personal, the individual, the psychological. So, can you maybe just tell us a little bit more about how you're using resilience as a concept or a theory in the studies. And then the, the second question is, I, I'm curious about sort of the prevalence of alternative housing approaches, um, mm -hmm. co-housing, yep. uh, the, what the state of the co-op sector, um, yeah. you know, social enterprise linked to uh, yeah. churches, not things like that, just yeah. experience that way. So, yeah. I think so one, one theoretical and then one just okay. a little more. Well, I think the second one is <laughs> easier to answer first, which is that, uh, so the, the kind of alternatives like cooperative housing, co-housing, um, yeah, that are happening. Actually, co-housing is happening a lot now with millennials, right? That's sort of a newer trend among the, the younger generation. So that those trends we supported quite heavily through CMHC in the 70s. And then when Mulroney came in, they all those programs were cut, except in Quebec, because they decided that it was so important that they would continue to fund co-op housing, which is why they have more co-ops in Quebec than like any other province. So, um, so, there, so what's happening right now through the national housing strategy is a lot more money is being poured into those alternatives. So co-op housing is being supported more, there actually, there actually is a lot more incentive now to form new co-ops, which there hasn't been for you know more than 20 years now. Most co-ops were formed in the 70s, and then there was another smaller group that were formed before 1996, and then nothing since then. So there's actually 
this, the CMHC is actually putting more money into those alternative forms now. So we're going to see that having an impact. Um, for this study, I just focused on, um, on rental housing, but that other uh, study I'm working on, on the neighborhood change, we're looking at nonprofit and co-op housing, and that's what we've heard from people is that there is, it's things, things have been very static for so long. There hasn't been a lot of support. And so, you know, for example, in Halifax, you have a thousand co-op units in the entire city. Um, so it really doesn't make a dent in, you know, the kind of people who actually need it aren't really getting it. Um, so now that there is more, more money, more investment going into it, we're probably going to see a change in that. Um, and then the first question was on resilience. So yeah, so the, res so the resilience question, the approach um, really is that, that, I, that I took was to really see housing as one of the urban systems that we have. Like, you know, just like we have transportation, we have, you know, water, you know, with sewer, stormwater systems. We have all these different systems and each of them, you know, needs to be resilient so that we can, they need to be strong, basically. And what we've seen in Canada is the last 40 years is just a slow, like, degrading of the housing system, really, in most cities. And so they've been, there's been a number of factors that have contributed to that. The number one issue has been lack of funding, but there's been other things, like we've had huge increases in certain population groups, particularly like immigrants in our large cities and that kind of thing, who need very specific types of housing. So they need very affordable housing, they need rental, they need larger units. Um, we're also facing now, like with seniors, you know, like we're a lot more adaptive things need to be happened, like rehabilitation needs to happen with units. So um, so I guess the con like the way that I've been using the, the resilience theoretical approach in the study is to just say that like if rental housing is a real component of what would make a system more sustainable and more resilient, and it's been really decimated over the last 40 years. And so this new, hopefully this, this new funding that's coming out right now, it's actually for cities to be really innovative. Like cities like Vancouver, Saskatoon, Saskatoon has been super innovative with rental housing. And so it's, it's actually for cities to do a lot more on their own using very clever tricks like using development fees and all this kind of very tiny limited amounts that they have because they don't have a lot of money. So um, they've managed to increase the resilience of their local systems like a little bit, but in order to really increase it to the level where it's not going to be damaged and then we're not going to see, you know, this huge loss of units over time and people, like basically there's units in every city now that can't even be rented out. They can't even be used because they're in such bad shape. So we wouldn't see that if we had um, a stronger system and a more stable kind of funding environment, basically. Is that, did I answer it? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Ren. Thank Hi. you. Um, I'm Murray. Hi. I really enjoyed your presentation. You touched on a lot of things that we think about and struggle with, and partly my question is going to be a comment on Karen's question, I think. Um, one of the things that we often end up doing in our planning studies is thinking about best practices and how best practices are, how they evolve, how you identify them, and how they get applied. Uh, you could think of what you're doing in this Cross Canada study as trying to identify best practices. Mm -hmm. So what I want to ask you about, one concern I've always had with, with um, attempts to identify best practices is that by the time you get some, to something that will apply across all settings, maybe it's so generic yeah. it's not that useful. Can you comment about that? And then in yeah. doing that, uh, and here's my comment on Karen's thing. One thing that I think about when I'm thinking about looking at policy learning and policy initiatives that may be transferable is what's the causal mechanism um, and what are the variables in which that causal mechanism is acting and whether mm. those variables are present elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, those are good questions. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, so for example, a lot of cities, well, I guess to start off your, your first basic thing about, about best practices. So one thing I learned with the TOD study in Amsterdam was we actually took, a, for that study, we actually reused completed case studies in TOD, and we actually wanted to get beyond this whole best practice thing because we found that with TOD, there was just so much emphasis on like, oh, this is like a great project, and like, it's fantastic. And like, it didn't really, you didn't really learn those things that maybe didn't, like, didn't work that well or that were, were hard for that municipality or that region to do. And so, um, like there was too much kind of uh, the pop, like it's almost like kind of you know whitewashed the whole thing or whatever. So what we wanted to do was get beyond that, and so we specifically chose a range of cases that actually some of them were would be considered failures. So we chose chose um, some cities that weren't really doing a very good job of of TOD. Like Toronto was one of our cases, which I think. 
you know, so it's not very, not really doing a great job of that. And then we chose some that were doing a really good job. So the whole reason behind that was there's a lot to be learned from the failure as well. So there's a lot to be learned by the fact that those cities aren't, people aren't collaborating in those cities. Um, they don't have very good public participation. The public don't accept what they're trying to do as planners. Um, they don't have very good support of their federal government or, or their or regional government. They've had a lot of upheaval maybe in their municipal government. So going from one end of the spectrum to the other and policies changing all the time. So there was a lot to be learned from cases that actually aren't perfect. Um, and that's what the approach that I tried to take with, with this study as well is some of these cities I chose specifically because they were doing really amazing innovative things, but you know, Halifax, was, for example, uh, Waterloo, you know, some of these places I chose because they, they could be doing a lot better and they're not. And so it's like, why aren't they doing better? And so that's what we're trying to hopefully to get out of, you know, the survey because we can't really get that from looking at the policies themselves. So we're hoping that people will tell us more about those barriers and why they're kind of our persistent barriers. And, you know, is there, are there issues like people aren't collaborating? There's a siloed approach going on. Um, and then the other question was about... The the it was about the specific. Can you rephrase the last one? It was like, right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. So again, every city is even though we're trying to take these take this approach where we're looking at cross case similarities there are still these unique things that are happening in, in each place. Like I, was, I mentioned about Quebec, you know, they've had this long-standing approach to rental and cooperative housing that they just think that those kinds of housing are important. People want those types of, to live in those types of housing. So they've made that decision a long time ago that they're going to continue to fund those types of housing. And it's one of the reasons why you don't have the affordability crisis happening in Montreal that you do in Toronto or Vancouver, for example, or, or even places like Mississauga. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty complicated when you start to think about like what's going on in each city, like when I put that that table up at the beginning, you know, had like some of the kind of statistics from from the census. It's, it is actually pretty hard to, you know, it's kind of like, well, why is this happening in Saskatoon? It's like they have a high vacancy rate, but then people are also more people are also paying over thirty percent of their income towards like what's happening there. So that I think that is what I what I want to do is try to get at that through the, the survey, and hopefully we get we figure out what's actually happening in those specific places, so that we can understand why things are the way they are and. Is there something that can be learned there, like that other cities can then can then use? Oh. Hi, thank you, Cliff Atlio. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in um, is sort of an open general question, but uh, across the 15 cities you're looking at, I'm curious about. Um, cities that are in crises, and obviously you're going to you either already have a sense or you're getting a sense that it's, it's a major issue in Vancouver, versus cities that may not be in a crisis, yeah. and, and you could argue have the luxury to say, okay, yeah, every city's got issues with poverty and affordable housing, and we got some space, we've got limited resources, but we got a little bit of space to do this. Whereas in Vancouver, it's like yeah, fire to fire to fire, and still. Yeah we do not see an end in sight yeah. um, and we're all wondering what, what's going to happen. Yeah. So I'm just curious about how that might impact yeah. your overall look in yeah. terms of crisis versus... That's a very good question. Yeah, that we actually had that exact same conversation with the TOD study and that was my the whole reason that we were studying that is because TOD, there were so many barriers to implementing TOD in the Netherlands and my, my uh, supervisor who was the lead of the project was saying, you know, I've been trying to do, you know, I've been trying to you know, activate this thing, or catalyze this thing to happen for 20 years and it's not gone anywhere and he's like, we need a crisis, <laughs> basically. He's like, that's why these other cities, that was his view, is that's why these other cities have been more innovative and I think that is partly the case that in cities like Vancouver, like that's why you see so much innovation, like you see like the, you know, the empty homes tax and the foreign buyers tax, all those things are just like so unique to Vancouver because of the unique pressures that this place has. But um, I don't know. I think that is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to, like, because I was thinking about Halifax, you know, living there, and it's like they don't have a crisis at this point, but it's getting there because it's a, it's a small city. I mean, it's, you know, it's a mid-sized city. It's four, just over 400,000. Um, until recently, they've had no problem creating rental housing. Developers have been really, you know, for it. But all of a sudden, in the last two years, you're seeing this upsurge in like the luxury condo development. Rental prices are going up. Um, rooming houses are being, you know, taken down. So you're losing the bottom end. The actually nonprofit housing providers have had to sell off units just to kind of keep. So and this is Halifax. We're talking, you know, it's not a big city with a huge amount of immigration and a huge amount of people coming in every year. So I think that was one of the reasons why. 
I wanted to look at a range of different sizes of cities with different type, you know, characteristics because it's like, well, what's a crisis in Halifax is not a, what's a crisis in Vancouver. So people are starting to talk a lot about this affordability issue. It's not called a crisis yet in Halifax, partly because they don't want it to get to the point that, you know, other cities have gotten to. So yeah, it is, it's definitely a consideration of like, you know, you know, I think that a lot of cities don't see the point of acting on it until there is really a problem. And then you got to do things like put up modular housing like in two days and house those people that are on the street and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think there is something to what you're saying in terms of, you know, at some, you, know you don't act until there's some kind of issue. Like I, was, I, was, I think I mentioned the example of Hamilton, um, you know, until, you know, within 10 years they lost, you know, 2,000 rental units and then their vacancy rate dropped below 1.5. 6%, that was a crisis. They, they voted to put a moratorium on condo conversion. So I think that is kind of, we are kind of reactionary a lot in issues like affordability because it's not politically popular. So if it's an issue that's politically popular, then you know, we, have, we can address it even if there isn't a crisis. But you know, providing affordable housing for people who should just be working harder or whatever people think about affordable housing. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people are really, you know, why should we provide affordable housing for people? Why can't they just, you know, why can't they just buy their own? What's wrong with them? I could afford a house, and it's like they bought their house for twenty thousand dollars in like nineteen seventy. Yeah, <laughs> so and they, you know, it was like a tenth of their income that they were paying towards rent or whatever. So yeah, so it's I think there's it's it's that is part of part of what you're saying is true. It's like this crisis mode. It partly it's in it, it's affected by this kind of political, I guess the the view of affordability and view of housing. Thanks, thanks for a really good overview. Uh, in, in interesting topic. I just want to go back to the question again of policy evaluation mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so when, when we look at policies, for example, we look at climate change policies, we try to develop a measure to assess the effectiveness of alternative policies. So we look at does it reduce greenhouse gas emissions and what is the cost per ton and compare all these policies mm. and have some kind of metric that allows us to go through the, the uh, many different policy options we have to try to rank them as to what is most effective. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you've got, we've got this great inventory of policies here and the, and the, and the measures, as you say, are, are, are more complex. But if we want to, and you did say at some point that some places have done a poor job and some places have done a good job. Yeah. So, so you are thinking in terms of the effectiveness of these policies. Yeah. Some work and some don't. And I know it's a complex environment to, to, to measure the effectiveness of these because of all the different uh, variables that are, that are at work here. Uh, but did you want to maybe just spend a, 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 a minute or two just talking a bit more about how through at some step down the road you may actually be able to look at this inventory of policies and say, okay, here's the ones that look like they really work well and, yeah. and these ones don't work well and how you go about doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, ideally you would, like I was saying earlier, like ideally you'd have municipal reports that would tell you like how many units were produced as a result of that policy and some cities do have that, like I said, like, you know, like Saskatoon and Winnipeg and, and Vancouver, Victoria have done a really good job, um, Hamilton, but, but there's other places like, you know, Waterloo, Halifax, you know, where it's really, really hard to track the results of like we put this policy in place and therefore we got this many units and you know, but um, I think that one thing that I, w I do wanna do is look at the kind of the strength of the policy. So, you know, it, what's the strength of the wording in the policy? Is it, you know, that we, you know, we might or we could do something? Is it we must do something? You know, that kind of like legislative, you know, wording, I guess that's in there. So how strong is the policy? Is it, has it actually been implemented? Um, is it actually having an effect? And that is, like I said, I think that's something that I hope we can get out of the survey um, more than we can get from just looking at the documents that are online because most cities don't have very good monitoring reports on this topic um, on housing, but some of them really do. Um, like Metro Vancouver or you know, Edmonton, they've, they've got really good um, reports where we can actually start to quantify those things. Um, so for me, like overall of the 15 cities, it is going to be more like what's the strength of the policy, how, how 
sort of how rigid are they, you know, in terms of the regulation. So like I think I mentioned Saskatoon before having a really good, um, very strong approach to condo conversion. So it's like if it goes below 1.5%, they won't allow conversion. The only reason they would allow it is if the building has been deemed like unsafe for like public, public, public health reasons. Um, so there, that's a pretty strong approach. Whereas other cities would just say, well, like we might not allow condo conversion. <laughs> just it's a very, we, I think some of the wording Mississauga's wording is literally, we won't allow condo conversion if it's if it's causes harm to the rental supply. So that's sort of very weak wording that you can t if as long as there's any kind of discretion in there, then people can take advantage of that. So that's the kind of thing that I want to do across all the policies is look at the strength of the policy wording and whether it's been implemented. If we can have those, if we have a measure of how many units have been protected, let's say, or how many condo conversion applications have been turned down. Then, yeah. At some point down the road, I guess you, you, you could go and look at how these various policies have affected some of those macro indicators uh, that, that are defined as uh, housing need. Sure. Right? Yes, you could look at whether whether the yeah like percentage so of people paying over thirty percent. Yes. Or the, mm -hmm. these other kinds of things. Sure, but the problem is you're relying on the census, which is every five yeah. years. So this is what I mean is like it's not linked to like the policy right. cycle, right? It's sort of like oh, and then if you're lucky, we have a long form census that year, mm -hmm. and if you're not lucky, we don't. <laughs> so like if you're trying to look at that in 2011, out of luck. <laughs> so. Yes, the biologist is time for the biologist to ask a question. Well, I didn't mention the word fisheries. Ha! Ah, he told me to mention exactly fisheries. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, I was thinking about your initial context being resilience, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't really see. To me, I wouldn't say this is a resilience kind of issue. I would say it's more of an adaptive issue and an evolutionary kind of issue because it, as you even pointed out in, in Vancouver, you know, all these policies that they try for a couple of years and see if they work, right? That mm -hmm. kind of tinkering with the system is probably, you know, is that something that you could measure across all these case studies and kind of develop metrics about that to see if that's a factor? The whether, well, I mean, like I said, some cities do a really good job of actually measuring that. Like they, they put a pilot project in place and they measure whether it worked and whether it didn't work. But other cities just adopt a policy and then don't monitor it. So it's sort of like, like it's a little bit hard to. Well, obviously we're trained at that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I'm wondering if it, if it's, if it tends yeah. to be over on this coast because, you know, these guys have been teaching. Like, for example, like if I was, like just to give the example of secondary suites, um, Halifax doesn't even keep a record of how many secondary suites there are in the city. Like, they don't even have, yeah. So this is, like, Jill Grant, who just retired from Dalhousie, just did a study on rooming houses. And they don't even keep a record of that. Like, it was just trying to find the data on what a rooming house, it ended up being, like, basically sending students out to, like, ground truth and be like, is that a rooming house <laughs> or not? <laughs> because because you could, there, was no, there was no data on it. Like, this is what I mean, is, like, cities just don't keep the same data. So it's really hard to do this kind of nice, quanti it would be great if you could do that, but it's really hard to do that kind of nice quantitative, like, you know, and they also don't don't adopt the same policies. Like the the market market 100, the housing 100 policy that Vancouver has, like no one else has that. So you couldn't really compare it to other places. You can see what they're doing and if it was successful, but yeah. Well, maybe we should let you carry on with. What yeah, I just have have a few more minutes about teaching. Yeah, sure, so. yes. I do have a little, a little bit more about teaching. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk. So my teaching, um, my approach to teaching, and because uh, Tom had mentioned that you wanted to hear about that as well. So, um, yeah, generally my approach to teaching is pretty simple, or my teaching philosophy is pretty simple, which is that um, I, I think with planning, you have to assume that most people coming into planning don't have a uh, base understanding of the field. So even people coming into a master's degree, they're probably coming in from some other degree. Um, so when we, I know you guys have that at, here, the school, like that's what happens at Dalhousie too. People are coming in from everything from forestry to geography to architecture. So you can't assume there's a kind of a base knowledge in planning. So the first thing that I try to do is to bring that base, you know, bring that base kind of knowledge and assume that people, there is kind of no underlying, um, you know, 
knowledge about planning to begin with. And then the second thing I try to do is develop skills in the students that they're going to be use, using as planners. So if they go work out in the field, they're going to need not only kind of hard skills, they're going to need things like obviously GIS and you know the kind of more technical skills, but they're also going to need to know you know how to engage the community and how to facilitate a discussion and those kind of softer skills too. So that's basically my approach is I try to integrate those two things in, in teaching. Um, so this is a slide that shows the courses that I've taught. Um, the going from undergraduate to graduate. Um, both Dalhousie and Oregon, where I worked, have this mix cross-listed courses. So you have both undergrads and grads in those courses. So that's to give a little summary of the kinds of courses that I've taught. Generally, um, you know, transportation, housing, social justice, and then kind of the more traditional land, uh, kind of land use planning and things like that as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about just three little approaches to teaching that I've used. Um, the first approach is to design a course that's um, oriented around a project. So I've done this uh, in several places. I actually did it at Dalhousie the last couple of years because I taught in urban design and environmental planning studio. But uh, I'll give you an example from Oregon, which is a housing policy uh, course that I designed. Um, Oregon has a sustainable city year program, and they partner with, the university partners with a different municipality every year. And the municipality develops a list of projects that they want to be completed. And then different faculty members can approach the, the municipality saying like, oh, well, I'd love to design a you know, course around this project. Um, we had everything from, so we worked with the city of Redmond that year, which is a city of about 20,000. It's about two and a half hours away from Eugene, where Oregon, or University of Oregon is. And um, they had this list of projects. The, the project that we ended up working on was the, their affordable housing plan. They, were, they needed a new, a new plan because they implemented theirs in 2007 and then the housing crisis happened, so nothing was implemented. <laughs> so now it was time to kind of redo it. And so we had, it was a very small class with just 11 students. Um, and so we ended up having two groups. So one group worked on, um, they did a policy analysis. They identified areas for implementation, um, other innovative strategies that other cities in that area had used. And then the other group conducted interviews with people in Redmond who, are, who were housing providers and people who were, who were working in that area to determine you know, what were some of the issues that had to be addressed and some kind of solutions that they felt would work there. And so the students, um, this is them, they went on, we went on a field trip to Redmond um, and, uh, then they met, all the, they met the planners, they met people who were going to be working on this plan, and then th they worked on their projects. They did a midterm presentation with the planners back in, or uh, back in Eugene, and then at the end of the term, they actually presented using video conference. So this is one of my students here presenting on video conference, um, and they uh, were basically came up with, the, they produced these two reports that the city then adopted and they ended up using to develop the housing plan. So it, it's a really interesting, it was a really great program that they had there. It's a program that's now been adopted by over 30 different universities in the US where you just kind of have this partnership and other other courses that were built around this sustainable city year program were like, you know, the architecture faculty did something, the law faculty did something. So they all, there were some really interesting projects that came out of this. And at the end of the year, they have a big, um, you know, a big meeting with all the kind of courses and all the people from the city as well, like the mayor and the counselors. So it was a really cool pro way to do, uh, design a course. Um, the second one is to integrate like the skills development, which I think I mentioned a little bit earlier. So I do this in a number of ways. So in this introduction course, I have this introduction to planning course that I've taught. It's generally an undergrad first year kind of course, or it could be a first year master's course even. Um, it's usually a fairly big class, so I got them to, um, I wanted them to develop some skills in like graphic design and representation, so um, I got them to design a community profile poster. So they had to describe a local community or neighborhood in terms of its, either its housing, its community or social elements, or its planning history and urban renewal uh, kind of history. Um, and so they had never designed a poster before, most of them, um, and so they could use any software that they wanted. Quite a few of these are free online software they can just use. And so these are some examples. These are first year students. So these are some of their posters. They're just 11 by 17, so just that size. So I think, you know, this student actually even used GIS on hers. So that was kind of amazing. So I think it was a really a good way of getting them right into the kind of skills that they're gonna be using in other courses and they're also gonna be using when they go out and communicate to the public, it's really important to be able to do this in a visual way that people who aren't planners are gonna understand what you're talking about. And then the third thing is uh, to introduce discussion guidelines. So this was something that I also started doing in the University of Oregon um, 
because there were a lot of issues about equity and people not feeling comfortable in classes and in class discussions. So what we just, we all decided to do was to introduce discussion guidelines and they were, they're gonna be, they were developed by the students initially and then every class, what we did is we put the guidelines up there and then we invited the students to edit those and make alterations or however they wanted to do it. And basically there are things that help us um, basically be respectful during conversations that we have during class and to be kind of open-minded to different ideas that come up even if we don't agree with them. And so that, what we did was then adopt these as the guidelines for the course and um, students basically would hold themselves to that kind of standard of behavior. So I think it was really useful because they felt that they had some ownership over what was, you know, how conversations were gonna go in class, but also that everyone felt more comfortable because there had been some issues, I guess, in previous years about people just feeling like they were being attacked during conversations and that kind of thing. So I think that was really useful, but it also was really good training for the future because quite often we have a facilitated, you know, discussion or something in planning. You actually do this. You actually do go through and set sort of guidelines and, you know, this is how we want it, this is how we would like to proceed in order for us to get to where we want to go. So it was good training, I think, for the students to kind of start to think that way. And again, this was, um, was the first year. No, it was a, I think it was a first year master's course. So, and then this is just a photo of, <laughs> of this cool workshop that we just had at Dalhousie, which was for high school students. It was through the Black Business Initiative. So it was for African Nova Scotian students who were trying to, they're trying to expose them to just sort of non-traditional careers. And so planning and architecture were two of those. So we had this workshop with the high school students uh, to try to get them to understand, you know, what, what was planning. And we had to do this in a very different way than we would if we were teaching undergrads or graduate students, obviously, because they are coming from some, actually the one kid in the front is like in the seventh grade. So they're, some of them were quite young. <laughs> so, so this is uh, our group, uh, some, most of us here, and the people from the Black Business in, in, in Initiative also were there. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea of where, you know, what kind of research I do, what kind of teaching I do, and um, this kind of, you know, my contribution to REM would really be on this kind of, you know, this contribution of housing and transportation to, you know, our more sustainable regions and cities. Um, yeah, and so hopefully I could also bring that kind of perspective on, you know, social sustainability and social equity and social justice issues, which I think are really a good fit with the environment, environmental kind of approaches here. That's it. <laughs> Any more questions? Sorry. The mic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're just getting started on um, the uh, gender diversity inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, type of activities and trying to find things to do. And so I'm curious about your, how you incorporate it into the classroom. Did you notice a, a big difference in, in the level of discussion and the? Um, so at Oregon, I so I was only there for the one year. So the, it, this, a few incidents happened before I got there actually. So I, when I got there, we started this whole discussion about, you know, what we could do about it. We had students involved. We had a kind of student faculty committee. We had HR involved. So I think that it was actually quite positive because there were students there. Oregon's a pretty non-diverse place. <laughs> so there were very few students who were a visible minority and they felt like really, they felt really conspicuous and uh, they felt like they were, if anything negative happened, they felt like they were being attacked. So, um, so yeah, I think it made a difference. I think it made a difference that we had the discussion up front, that we were up front about it. Students could ask questions and then they, um, I guess that we kind of understood that there was a base level of respect to, towards each other and I think it made a difference. I mean, like I don't, I don't know because I wasn't there the previous year, but I certainly didn't have any experiences in, in my classrooms and, Again, though it might be the fact that I am a visible minority person, and so people are less, um, with me and another faculty member noticed that, well, we haven't had any of those incidents, but other people have, hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, and then you also, in the States, you kind of get, um, you know, you're the person that the students come to. So if they are a visible minority student and they're having an issue, they come to you. So that, that happened a couple times for sure, yeah. But, um, 
I think that you know part of that is the U.S. because um, you know Dow certainly is not Halifax is not diverse either. We have also very few students who are um, a visible minority or Aboriginal descent or any of those. So, um, so, but it hasn't really been an issue at Dalhousie ever. I would say that when I was hired, one of the courses I was asked to teach that was a new course was going to be the social justice because I was part of hiring me was because our accreditation had always been hinging on, you know, you're not really addressing equity issues. So that was one of the reasons they got that, the position that when I was hired was to kind of address that issue. But um, students are like, have loved that course on social justice. So, because we talk about everything from environmental justice, you know, food security, gender, um, like sort of urban redevelopment and some, you know, how displacement and those kinds of issues. So it's been, it's been, I think a lot of students have said, because our, our faculty really is, really focuses on more the design kind of the side of planning, the kind of more physical planning side. And typically those issues like social issues kind of get left out of that, those courses. So I think that it's, people have been really appreciating that. We had, a, we actually had, I was part of a connection grant in the fall where we had a whole a one, one day symposium on social justice and it was, it was really great. We had people in from all over Canada and the US and yeah, it was, I think, bringing that issue. The person who organized it is this woman, Ingrid Waldron, who does a lot on environmental justice issues. Um, and so she, um, she was really feeling like that issue wasn't being discussed enough in Halifax. So yeah, I think there's a lot of room to kind of discuss these issues more. There's some really amazing things being done too. We had a great person from our First Nations come in and talk about like, you know, being a, like a water, as a water defender and talking about the role of Aboriginal communities in protecting natural resources. So that was really cool, I think, for the students. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you one more uh, research question. Oh. Um, although I, I, I may, might come back to the, uh, the to the planning piece, as, uh, planning students as well. The, um, I'm w wondering uh, w what examples you might point to in terms of r how regional governance systems are contributing to that resilience that you're looking mm -hmm. for in the housing stock, and and are, are there any places across the country that you think are doing it well? Yeah, that's a really good question too, um, because housing is like transportation is one of those issues where all three levels of government are involved. Um, and if there is a regional government, it usually is pretty influential. We definitely found that with the TOD study that we did was that if, if there was a regional government, and in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, you have these city regional governments, so there's even another level <laughs> that it that does definitely make a difference in terms of, but only if only if there is sort of an effort to collaborate, like to bring. So if the regional government's role, part of their role is to is to get the municipality to collaborate, then yeah, it does make a difference, I think. So Metro, that's what I think that one of the reasons why it's not just the city of Vancouver that's doing innovative things here. It is also Burnaby. It is also Surrey. It is, you know, like that, because Metro, Metro is actually, Metro Vancouver is actually, it's, it's their agenda as well. So I think when you have a regional government that really is, you know, if it's part of their agenda to actually bring people together and talk about how to solve these policy issues. And even if it's, even if there isn't a regional government, but because we saw this as well in the Netherlands, even if there's no regional government, but there's, let's say, a committee that crosses, you know, different agencies or draw, crosses different organizations, that can also be a way of, um, you know, basically getting people to, to try to solve an issue together and actually try to implement it together. Um, so, yeah, I think Edmonton is a really good example of that, like where they have these community-based organizations that are super involved in not only just, they get involved in reviewing the plans and strategies, but they also do, they, they, they monitor these things, they evaluate, you know, how successful the plans are. So I think, you know, even though those are, it's not a regional government, it's, they're actually community-based organizations, but they're doing a pretty good job. So there, it really, I think, yeah, the regional government can play a really strong role, but only if they... Like, for example, in Toronto, or so Toronto is a really good negative example of this because the, because the growth secretariat is supposed to function in that role, but, but they don't because they don't want to interfere in the municipality's governance. And so what you have is these, there are some regional governments, like you have Region of Peel, you have, you know, you have these regional York and, and whatever, but they also aren't really great at that. So they don't really coordinate very well between the municipalities and then there isn't an overarching thing for that whole region. It's like you have a regional growth strategy, but no regional government. So it's a, it's, you know, I think, I think it does play a role, but it's, it's, I guess, pretty complicated to figure out what that role is. That's why I think that like, you're doing interviews or, or at least hopefully the survey kind of some of those things come out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to, uh, one last question here in terms of um, 
the teaching approach. Yeah. And I really appreciate your comment, you know, students coming in from different backgrounds yeah. in, into planning. And that's certainly the case in REM. Uh, but in addition to geography and architecture, you have fish biologists and mm -hmm. climate modelers and things like that. So, you know, can you maybe just describe what that process is of, of introducing them to planning and how, you know, how quickly you transition into things that are a little bit more uh, in depth? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say, I mean, we certainly had people, when I was at UBC, we certainly had people coming from like environmental studies into, into um, planning. But yeah, so what, um, yeah, that's a good question. So I mean, like the, the book that I designed for the intro to planning course is that's sort of the reason I designed it that in that way is like you basically start off with, you know, this is what planning is, this is what we've been doing in Canada, in Canada generally in planning, and then these are some theories that, you know, planners, that are important to planners, and then you go into kind of the substantive, you know, areas, like, you know, you might start off with natural resource, you know, like there is, there are planners that just, there's case studies in the book that are about that. There's, you know, case studies on climate change adaptation, so maybe you start, if you have more students who are starting off from, from that side, maybe you start off with that part of planning. Um, and then you kind of go into the areas that are a little bit more urban, I would say, or not, not as connected to the natural systems, like urban design might be, maybe that you do that later on in the, in the term. Yeah, I, th I think it would depend on how, yeah, you'd have to kind of gauge like what's, you know, what students' backgrounds were a little bit to kind of adapt it. <laughs> but I think that's easy to do. I don't think there's like a natural, like there isn't like, oh, we well, have to start with land use planning and then you have to, you know, I think you can kind of adjust it depending on the students that you have. It's a, kind of a trivial question, but we were wondering on your first slide what the three cities are that you have a pic picture of on your very, oh, very first slide. Amsterdam was Amsterdam was one of them. Yeah. The first one was Amsterdam. Let me see. Were all of the pictures from Amsterdam? No. Uh, let me see. One of them looks like Vancouver. That, the, that one's from Vancouver. I think that one is from Calgary. Yeah, that one's from Calgary. The, the one on the left. Yeah, that. Yeah, this, this one's Amsterdam. The oh, big one. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's a sub that's this is literally the furthest out in the suburbs that you can get. That's what it, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Where's the canal? Yeah. There is there actually a, there is actually a canal like right behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just thought that was, it was, it, it's always fascinated me that, you know, this is what the suburbs look like in a place like the Netherlands, which again has, we we're talking about, you know, like this, no, no room to kind of, you don't have room to spread out, so go up. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Katarina. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought I, if I could ask you a research question. Sure. Um, if you were to apply sort of the approach that you did with your study to smaller Canadian cities. Mm -hmm. So think cities like less than 100,000 or even around that like 30,000 yep. um, range. Do you think that, like what kind of things do you think you would find? Because I think one of the challenges for those cities is that they don't have a lot of those policies available to them yep. to try to address housing issues. That's a good question. So uh, usually cities of that size don't really have affordability issues. They're usually quite affordable. Um, there are some exceptions to that, like there are some, you know, resource-based towns maybe where, you know, people might be, actually that's what happened with Saskatoon, to be honest, like all of a sudden, like people are moving there to like do the resource extraction thing there, and so they had to all of a, all of a sudden, they were like, oh, a million new people just moved, <laughs> you know, so, so they had to all of a sudden uh, develop those policies. So I think um, with the smaller cities, you would find, you would definitely find there would be, probably wouldn't be, it's like, Pepper was saying earlier, there, there wouldn't be kind of a crisis probably, so then they wouldn't have developed the policies. But it doesn't mean that they couldn't develop. Um, there's also been some really interesting, like, you know, Whistler, for example, it's not a huge city, but they had to develop unique policies because they're a resort community, right? But because they're a res resort municipality, they were able to do, it so, so it was sort of like having a Vancouver charter, like they were able to do things a bit differently. So they actually started a housing trust, and um, so they they have both ownership and rental units, and it's basically, they created that because otherwise people who work 
worked in the hotels and at the ski center and all that stuff could never afford to live there. And they created it way back in the 70s. So it basically allows, it basically the only, you have to, if you are going to live in those units, you have to live or work in Whistler. So it makes sure that people aren't like commuting from way over and like all over the place to kind of get there. So, so even the smaller places, I think, have the ability to kind of create. So I think if you were doing this study with small cities, you'd really have to look for those examples. But again, you'd probably want to have a range of cities that you know, have some of them that have those and some of them that don't, so that you understand, like, well, why don't these other ones have them? I, I was just interested as why, from a governor's point of view, you picked municipalities mm -hmm. and, and omitted provinces, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. historically That's a lot a of the most significant interventions mm -hmm. uh, in housing policy have emanated from uh, provincial governments yeah. and, of course, the federal government. Yeah. And I guess you get that, that in a bit, because when you look at different cities and different jurisdictions, yeah. you, you do look at some. But what, why wouldn't you? Uh, or at some point, are you going to look at, at the provincial uh, yeah. comparisons as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So what we you, we did look at the, the CMAs for the most part. Like the only one that isn't a CMA is uh, Mississauga. And the reason for that was because Mississauga was doing things that like the CMA, like that other places weren't doing. So um, yeah, so uh, the reason that I chose to look at the cities was because of places like Vancouver and Saskatoon, which were doing things that the province, like they were doing things unique of the province, right? And so that's why I like I took that approach. But there are sort of exceptions. That I think that Quebec is an exception. Like they have such strong policy on this, but most provinces actually don't. They kind of take their lead from from the federal government. And because CMHC was not innovative for a long time, the provinces weren't innovative either. And so when when you because like I was saying earlier, like some of these cities were really pushed to the crisis point, so they had to do something. And they weren't getting any, because the provinces are sort of intermediary, right? Like, they only do something if they get money from CMHC. Otherwise, it's kind of like, eh, like, they aren't really taking a lot of action. So yeah, that landscape is changing pretty fast, so it would be interesting at yeah. some point to look at. It is, that, yeah. It's to look at what provinces are doing as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it, right now, it's a very kind of volatile time because the national housing strategy just came out, and it's just being implemented, and provinces are kind of scrambling to try to to make sense of that and how they're gonna change their programs and their structure to kind of implement those things. But really it's that, yeah, I think that's why I chose to, to look at the municipal governments and what they were doing because when you see like inaction from the federal government for so long, then like Halifax in particular is a great, like Nova Scotia is a great example. Like people have even said to me, like people from Housing Nova Scotia have said to me like, oh yeah, we didn't really do anything around policy. It was just, we were a bricks and mortar shop is the way they, Basically, they, they saw themselves as property managers, and that was it. So they weren't doing anything to kind of innovate in, in a policy sense at all. And they, they fully admit that. So now it's like they have to because of the provincial, or because of the federal role it's changing. So, okay. yeah. Well, join me in thanking uh, Brent for a good <laughs>